to the Miami Township Trustee Meeting of December 4th, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, tonight we're going to go through our regular business as quickly as possible and save room for um, a presentation and comments um, by our special guest, Vesper Energy. Um, so I'd like to call this meeting to order and um, entertain a, a motion to adopt the minutes of both November 6th and November 20th. You want to do them together or separate? Um, Let's do them together. I, could, I think we've read right. better than early. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I second. Um, any discussion? I have um, made a couple of corrections, but they were made, and that's good for me. Hearing no discussion, may we vote on the adoption of minutes? To move and second to adopt the minutes of November 6th and November 20th, 2023, as presented. Uh, Mr. Ruther? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. Mrs. Moore? Yes. Minutes are approved. Um, okay. I entertain a motion to approve our payment of bills in the um, amount of $46,754.85. That's general fund $6,080. 854.07, fire fund $36,340.10, EMS zero, cemetery fund $588.01, road and bridge $2,972.67. Can I get a motion to pay our bills? I so move. A second. Any discussion? No. Hearing no discussion, may we vote? Been moved and seconded to approve payment of bills in the amount of forty-six thousand seven fifty-four eighty-five as enumerated. Mr. Hollister. Yes. Mr. Mutcher. Yes. Ms. Moyer. Yes. The motion is passed. All right. Here's our list of correspondence. Um, I, I don't feel the need to read all these. It's it's on the agenda. On the agenda, and that that serves a you know, positive public information function, but. Okay, Don, I would like to point out that we had the following people send in letters regarding the topic tonight, which is industrial solar in the township. Um, all in support, that was Libby Rudolph, Dan Rudolph, Bob Brecka, Ellis Jacobs, Donna Denman, Beth Holyoke. Um, other than that, sure, I'll skip it. Um, fire department report, Denny. Uh, since last meeting, 22 EMS incidents, uh, six fire. Uh, we only had one uh, fire mutual aid request. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to probably go from backwards here. Uh, ground ladder testing was last week. All ground ladders uh, did pass successfully. Uh, Engine 82, you're aware we had some pump issues with that. Um, uh, Atlantic will be here tomorrow evening to start uh, diagnosing that and, and uh, figuring what we need to do to fix that. Uh, the 1,200 feet of five inch supply line uh, that cost nearly $12,000 arrived uh, the other day. Um, so we'll get that in service once engine 82 is actually back in service because I'm gonna have to pull that hose off to replace the sensor so no, more, no sense in doing additional work. Um, we are now in the implementation phase. I told you guys actually in, in uh, one of the uh, documents I provided you guys a couple weeks ago that uh, we would be moving to a new asset and checklist application. That's all part of our ESO software um, that integrates with our patient care reports. So we'll be able to basically track a lot of our EMX expenses significantly more accurately, more timely. Um, and gives us just in general a much better way of not only tracking expendable equipment, but also making sure that we've got good documentation on uh, any types of apparatus daily checks and, and uh, whatnot. And that's actually, oh no, no, I'm sorry, forgot something. Um, a little longer discussion item, but uh, the Greene County Health Department approached about five fire departments in Greene County that are known to have statistically somewhat higher than usual opioid overdoses. Uh, as you may be aware, the state is looking at targeting basically machinery that would be available to supply uh, Narcan uh, for opioid overdoses. That's really hard to say for some strange reason. <laughs> 
And um, so we uh, are going to participate in giving them limited access to our patient care data. They'll basically be scraping that data directly out of ESO using <coughs> software. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have access to specific information like patient names or anything like that. So the, the HIPAA confidentiality requirements have been approved and uh, by the prosecuting attorney's office. So I don't have any HIPAA concerns or anything like that. Uh, best part is it didn't cost me a dime. Uh, the health department is paying for it. Uh, for the data extraction for ESO, and I am anticipating that will probably start next month. It's us, Beaver Creek, Fairborn, Xenia. Actually, that's it. That's it. Us, Beaver Creek, Fairborn. Yeah. That's all I got. Okay. Any, any, do you have anything more for the fire department? No. I don't. Okay. Um, it, will there be a cemetery and road report tonight? Probably not. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, moving along. Um, fiscal officer report. We have a couple of resolutions to pass real quick. We have resolution 223.46, whereas it is an un, um, for permanent appropriations, amendment of the permanent appropriations, whereas it is an ongoing process to accurately appropriate funds according to the needs of the township. Now, therefore, the trustees authorize amending the following appropriations. General fund um, increase of 157.50. Gas tax, Social Security by 29.76. Cemetery fund um, contracted services increase 1,556. Fire fund um, Medicare increase $335. Um, do I have a motion to um, appropriate these? Funds? So moved. I'll second. Any more discussion? <coughs> Any call roll, Cindy. Uh, new and seconded to approve resolution 2023 46, an amendment to permanent appropriations as enumerated. Mr. Moocher? Yes. Mr. Hauser? Yes. Ms. Moyer? Yes. The resolution is approved. Okay, we have a second one from our off fiscal officer. Um, oh. Resolution 2023-47, whereas the tax commissioner has authorized the transfer of funds as follows, $269,175.85 from the capital fund 4901 to 2023 capital project fund for an ambulance acquisition. Um, the Miami Township trustees authorized the fiscal officer to do so immediately. Can I get a motion for that? I so move. <laughs> and um, any further discussion? No. You guys don't know about this, no. but Chris pursued this. The details are another topic, but <laughs> he should be saluted for freeing up $270,000. May we vote, please? It's been moved and seconded to Thank approve you. resolution 2023-47, transfer of funds as specified. Mr. Hollister? Yes. Mr. Moocher? Yes. Ms. Moyer? Yes. The resolution is adopted. All right. Any more for the fiscal officer who is not here? I have one additional thing. Um, related to that transfer, that transfer is for the purchase of a new uh, ambulance um, that's being built as we speak. Probably won't be delivered till mid-summer, I think. Uh, that ambulance is going to cost three hundred thirty-six thousand dollars and three hundred thirty-six thousand thirty-seven dollars. We just uh, helped it out, helped that cost out with uh, two hundred sixty-nine thousand one hundred seventy-five dollars and eighty-five cents, leaving a gap of sixty-six thousand eight hundred sixty-one dollars and seventy-five cents. Um, our fire fund is uh, very, very tight and. We expect it to be very tight in the in the short future. Anyway, we're working on that diligently. Um, our general <coughs> fund has uh, two hundred thousand dollars in its uh, account to carry over into twenty twenty four. To be a little more fiscally responsible and to keep our bookkeeping straight and help us uh, keep track of 
what funds we have to spend in what different accounts. I would like to move that we transfer $66,861.15 from the general fund into the new capital fund, 2023 capital fund acquisition for a total of $336,037 to cover the cost of this medic when it is delivered. When will that be? Um, sometime in the summer. Sometime in the summer. Last I heard. But it allows us to accurately appropriate funds from different funds going forward, both as a temporary amount as of January 1 and a permanent amount as of April 1. So, um, you know, those funds will be moved. They're committed. We know they're, we know they're paid. You're the supposed to do this paid. tonight. Yeah. And did you make a motion? Uh, I did. I'll second. Any further discussion? Uh, um, this is sudden, but um, it makes sense, so. Um, shall we vote, Cindy? It's been moved and seconded to transfer 66, make sure I get these numbers right, please, Chris. 66,861.75 or 15? 15. 15. 15. Uh -huh. $66,861.15 from the capital fund to the new 2023 capital fund um, for purchase of the medic. Um, Mr. Moocher? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Motion is approved. Okay, for the fiscal No, I. Um, zoning inspector report. Just a couple of things. Um, I issued a, one permit since I last uh, spoke with you uh, for a very small addition to a house, uh, a little tiny back porch and steps, but nevertheless it was an alteration. Um, the Zoning Commission met on schedule. They um, believe that they are satisfied with the language they've developed for revising the temporary use permits under the BZA Chapter 18. And they have uh, probably come to a consensus on what solar regulations they um, are proposing to be adopted in, in the code, but they're still working on the wording that that expresses the concept they have in mind. And part of that has been been um, looking at other adopted um, codes because the sample text we have they couldn't seem to plug into to get exactly what they wanted to say. Uh, can you summarize what what the zoning commission wants to? Well, that I've always a, a little hesitant to 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 speak for them, but I would say in general they want to. Um, I'm going to put it in the negative. Not allow solar as for the purpose of selling electricity to anyone. Now, all the solar you need for your own use on your own property is fine. They're also emphasizing um, rooftop solar so that that land isn't taken out of cultivation for, for solar arrays. But if, if rooftops don't, aren't adequate or, or appropriate for the situation, then, then ground mounted is, it would be permissible. That's r roughly what was in the sample one. At least there was part of that. Yeah, it, so it's I'd it's trying to qualify how you say that it's for your use. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an example. Suppose you're um, you're a, you're a farmer and you need uh, a large amount of electricity at one time of the year, but not a steady amount all year long. Can you have enough panels to supply that, that need for a, a month or three months or whatever it is, 
and then, but once you have them, still connect into the grid and 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 uh, sell that back. And it's these regulations are always a little bit tricky because the rules that the utilities have about how you get credit for for electricity keeps changing. But anyway, that's the the details that they're they're trying to work out. And where it's it's also you know it's not one of those things you can quantify because our our possible needs on a even on a personal level for solar may go up as people want more uh, electric vehicles or uh, you know other needs than we than we currently have now and at some point uh, maybe the, the the rooftop basis of that's about the right amount won't be the right amount yeah. but it's um, making a stab at what seems appropriate today with the knowledge that it may have to be revised in the future because it's a little difficult to predict what the future's going to be. Thank you. Anything else for Zion? I have two things. Uh, one, I would like to uh, ask the board if we can continue our tradition of um, offering uh, gift cards to our zoning commission and BZA for their uh, efforts over the past year. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Do we need to vote on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've done it each year, yeah. I move that we reward our volunteer boards with Christmas or holiday gift cards. I think we need to specify how many. <laughs> <laughs> there are hundreds of cards. Okay, let's put that in the motion. Hundred dollar gift cards for each. There are there are ten. I'll second. Wreck the surprise of the. Of, of the <laughs> <laughs> what is this? this <laughs> wreck the surprise. I second. One more alert. <laughs> Any more discussion? Good. Um, may we vote? It's been moved and seconded to um, present each member of the zoning commission and BZA with one hundred dollar gift holiday gift cards from the board. Um, Ms. Moyer? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. Ms. Moocher? Yes. The motion is approved. I have one more thing. Uh, may not be too much of an interest to a wider audience, but over the past, gosh, year, year and a half, we have spent considerable time, and Chair Moyer has spent considerable effort in trying to rethink our zoning uh, department, as it were, uh, to make it a little more efficient, a little more responsive. Um, she has done multiple uh, online applications for uh, various permits, and, and uh, um, I want to thank her for those efforts. In addition to that, she has also uh, made efforts to redirect some of the responsibilities to uh, different personnel uh, within uh, the zoning department. Some of that has been accomplished, some of it is still to be decided, but we met at our last meeting and wanted to pretty much finalize the direction that we wanted to go. Um, And so what we're going to do is we're going to make some of those changes in personnel. And as a result, uh, this will be Mr. Zoff's last meeting this evening. And I'm going to make a motion to terminate his employment as of today. I second. I'm going to recuse myself from this. Uh, I feel like my bond with Richard is, uh, takes me out of the rational world. That's perfectly fine. We move and seconded to terminate uh, Mr. Zoff's employment with the township as zoning inspector. <clears throat> Mr. Mercer? Yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Motion is approved. Now, in addition, finally, I don't have frankly, enough words to thank Richard for the work that he's done since he's been here. Uh, it's a thankless job. 
99.9% of the time, um, it's constant badgering by a lot of people, <laughs> and, and but some, you know, they get along just fine with them. Um, so, I, I was, I, I feel like I was there when we put you on to the Zone Commission, and I'm here when you're leaving, and you know, as a whole, I really appreciate everything that you did, and I hope I'm speaking for the, the rest of the board. And that's all I have for the zoning tonight. Okay. There is a motion. We did vote. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. I think that's all of, for our um, regular business. Um, we have special guests here today, Vesper Energy. Um, who are the um, developers of the Kingwood project, whose application has been denied, but is the process is still pending. Um, I'd like to say, for those of you who don't know, there, there's two different sides of the solar going on in the village. There's what we call industrial solar, which is above 50 megawatts, basically above about 300 acres. And then there's small solar that's under 50 megawatts that is regulated by the township trustee, um, the township zoning resolution. And um, so just a brief history, somewhere around 2021, 20, before I was on the board, we began hearing news of this solar development to um, Kingwood, 175 megawatts, nearly 2,000 acres, and um, it was a sharp learning curve, and we quickly learned that everything above 50 megawatts is regulated by the state, and so it was out of our jurisdiction. Um, we were asked to become, we were urged to become inter, so we had no say in the process, except for to be an intervener in the state's process at the PSB. And we were urged by neighbors, primarily, to be interveners. And, and anybody who wants to correct me on it, this is fine. Um, through a long arduous, after a long arduous process and grief and heartache from mm -hmm. some of the neighbors, um, it was denied, and it was denied on the basis of um, opposition. What what they call it? Um, public interest. Public interest. Convenience and necessity. See it. Say it again. Public interest, convenience, and necessity. But it wasn't denied on the basis of technical or environmental <coughs> damage. And um, so then you appeal to the Supreme Court, and I still don't understand where all that went, but we were asked again as trustees, do we want to do a cross appeal where we are still urging them to deny it on the basis of environmental and technical things? And we went along with that once. And after something else happened, we, asked, we were asked again. In the interim, I personally had began to, begun to investigate the environmental claims that, that were brought to us over the years, and visiting sites and reading and visiting more sites. And I personally came to feel that the um, environmental damage claims, the um, destruction of farmland, the compacting of farmland, the leaching of um, contaminants didn't hold water. That I and I, in our last vote, I meant to vote no, but instead I abstained. I did not vote to go ahead and continue to um, support opposing it based on those claims. Um, but the other two did, and so we're still involved in a cross appeal in this process. So I just want um, so. Meanwhile, SB 57 or 157 gave the Green County commissioners the ability, the, um, the power to restrict solar in all or any part of the township and any of the Green County townships. And their, their policy was, we're gonna let the townships decide. If a, if a township wants the restriction, we'll, we'll restrict it for them. So Cedarville and Xenia put a restriction forever 
on all industrial solar in their townships. I say forever, well that's for as long as, <laughs> until it gets overturned by another county commission. But um, we opted, F, initially we opted to not, to just let the chips fall where they may and not do that. And then we were urged again and we put a two year moratorium on just everything south and east of the Little Miami River, which is the key with area. Technically, we asked the county commission to do that, and they Yes, did it. technically, we asked the county commission to do that. that. The other one was six months. This was two years. That started in June, July of 23, so we'll end in July of 25. Um, so that's where we are now. I, and I wanted to say, there's stuff going on with our, you heard in, in Richard's report, the, the Zoning Commission is working out the small solar, you know, everything out of 300 for the township. So far, um, I, I don't think Jennifer Adams, I think you participated last month. There has not been much public participation in that. Um, and there, it, it's a lengthy process that goes here to the Green County regional planning and back to us and somewhere along the line I think there's at least two public hearings and I um, I urge people to pay attention to that because I'd hate to get all the way to the public hearing to have it be the first read of the public. It, it's it's a much better process if the public stays informed all along. So at this point, Chris would you like to say some few words about how you view yeah, our policy sure. making? And um, I guess being the uh longest serving uh, member of the township. Um, the experience that I've had with, with members of the public and in um, public meetings and hearings and the like, zoning commission and, and trustee public hearings for zoning changes and all. It's always struck me that um, th there's not quite a 100% uh, understanding of how policy is or is not produced in, in a township. And I just thought I'd take a second to, to review how that procedure works. Townships and counties are the same in as much as they're, um, they're, they're children of the Ohio legislature. Uh, we are not uh, authorized to make any laws um, other than those granted to us by the, uh, by the legislature, uh, and that includes uh, anything uh, to do with land use planning. Um, we have zero, as a board, we have zero uh, ability to make policy. The policy for land use planning in a township is driven by the township residents. We represent the township residents. It is the will of the township residents that we hope to follow. I mean, that's, at least personally, that's what I felt I was elected to do, was to represent the will of the township residents. The way that's accomplished is we establish a zoning commission, 1962 or 1963, and the township zoning commission is that five-member board which is authorized to uh, work on, on policy through zoning. The main way that they are uh, authorized to do that is to establish a comprehensive land use plan for their township. They, and only they, not us, produce this comprehensive land use plan. That's done through a strictly public process Every deliberation, every public hearing, every part of the comprehensive land use plan that's put together through the township is public. And any member of the public, obviously, is welcome to come and voice their opinion as to what they feel is important for their township in land use plans. This comprehensive plan use, land use plan was adopted, I believe, in 2013. Most land use plans are are projected out 20 years. That doesn't mean they can't be changed at any time. They can be changed every six months if the Zoning Commission felt the need to, 
but they're supposed to kind of make this plan far enough out that it, it's not sort of a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, roadmap. It's, it's more of a where do we want to go, and then once where do we want to go has been decided, then the Zoning Commission starts working on zoning, policy, zoning procedures and policies as kind of the roadmap of how to get there. Could, could I just insert the Certainly. Zoning Commission only uh, as residents outside of municipal boundaries, not in Clifton, not in Yellow Springs. So the Zoning Commission members are sort of rural township. So now, if everything's working perfectly, the residents make their um, wishes known. The Zoning Commission takes that into consideration and writes a good, strong, comprehensive land use plan. I think we did that 10 years ago, reflecting what they've learned. From that point on, everything that they're doing in zoning, the, 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 the minimum, uh, the minimum uh, land use for a residential is always the case. Uh, you know, how many acres per single family home, how many road, feet of road frontage, those things uh, are decided based on their interpretation of the comprehensive land use plan. Now here's where it does come to us. Once they've decided that they're happy with some particular zoning ordinance that they're working on, for example, Richard was talking about um, a, a one that they're working on right now. It goes to the county regional planning for review. And basically that review is just sort of a, a, a double, uh, you know, a, a double check whether what they've written does indeed uh, reflect the township's uh, comprehensive land use plan. And if it does, Generally, they will then recommend to this board that we adopt what they've recommended. They don't have to, and if they if they think that it, it is not in line with the comprehensive land use plan, they will recommend that we do not adopt it because of that, that very reason. It then comes to us. This is after multiple public hearings. The zoning commission has to have public hearings on these on these new regulations. The board of trustees have to have public hearings on these new regulations before it's voted on. And so then it finally gets to us. Now you could say, this is the part where we, you know, we make policy. I guess you could say that because let's just say that a recommendation comes to us that says, uh, um, I don't know how it would get through, but it says the zoning commission has changed that from three acres and 300 feet to uh, unlimited amount of residences and no, you know, and and no. Uh, and, and, and no limitation on, or on how many feet of road frontage. Even though the comprehensive plan says that we are a uh, we are a uh, agricultural township and we support uh, and the public supports farmland preservation. Well, if you have unlimited ability to build build housing, that, in my opinion, anyway, conflicts with the comprehensive land use plan. And as a board we could then reject that recommendation from the Zoning Commission and not adopt this, this plan for unlimited housing. In a fashion, that would be um, creating policy. Flip it over to, flip it over to, uh, uh, to, to virtually anything. It, it could be um, industrial, it could be solar, any of those sorts of things. But in my opinion, the board has to be convinced that it's in accordance with the land use plan. So this land use plan, and I'm just about done. <laughs> this land use plan can can be yeah, can be um, a, uh, can be amended at any time. Can be revised, revisited at, at any time. There's no restriction on that. And the zoning commission makes that decision. They decide that they would like to hear what the residents have to say on a new subject, let's call it solar. And so they would say, this is what we're considering, we'd like their input, blah, 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 they hold these hearings. And based on that, they revise the comprehensive land use plan and it addresses solar or wind or water power or, or, or any number of things, but let's just 
use solar as an example. Once it's in the comprehensive plan, then they write new zoning uh, ordinances reflecting what they feel is the uh, will of the residents. And again, then it comes to us and we either uh, approve or deny uh, those new zoning ordinances based on that. So that's where we are. I just want everybody to understand and I appreciate their, um, I certainly appreciate it. There's the plan for it. I appreciate your participation. It's also online. And I, and I appreciate your, any comments that you may have, but please keep in mind, we cannot make policy at this level for or against. So with that, I'll give it back to the chair. We can merely be, at this level, merely be interveners in a state process. That's true. Okay. At this point, I'd like to um, introduce Lindsay Workman from Vesper and Hannah Larkin. Hannah Larkin. <laughs> Thank, you, Hannah. Thank you so much, trustee. Thanks, Marilyn. My name is Hannah Larkin. I am with Vesper Energy, and it's my colleague, Lindsay Workman. Um, I'm just going to go over our brief agenda for this evening before we dive in. We're going to start with some introductions. I'll introduce myself and the company, and then we'll talk a bit about our new proposed solar project called Aviation Energy Center. Then we will talk, well, Lindsay will talk about community engagement and the benefits we expect to see from this project. And then finally, we'll open up the floor to questions, comments, as you all deem appropriate. <laughs> So as Marilyn said, my name is Hannah Larkin. I'm a development manager with Vesper Energy. I oversee the Kingwood Solar Project and our Aviation Energy Center project. I joined Vesper about six months ago. Um, I have a background, I have a master's of the environment in urban resilience and sustainability from the University of Colorado. I have an undergraduate bachelor's of science degree in global and environmental health from the University of Rhode Island. I currently live in Rhode Island. I just relocated from Colorado about six months ago. Um, when I'm not working at Vesper, you'll find me out with my dog somewhere. Love, I'm an outdoor enthusiast, so I love skiing in the winter and being on the beach and going hiking in the summer. Um, that's a little bit about who I am, and I'll pass to Lindsay to talk about who she is. Hi, everyone. I know I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, so nice to see you again um, my name like Hannah mentioned I am Lindsay Workman I am the community affairs manager for Vesper Energy working in Ohio and a few other Midwest states I'm born and raised I'm a born and raised Ohioan I'm from a little town called Jackson Ohio if any of you recognize it or know the name I don't expect many too, many too but um, I came back to, to Ohio for this job and I'm very much enjoying being back here and back in the Buckeye State and back in spending so much time here in Greene County. I am an avid history buff, huge history buff. I really appreciate what the history that goes to in here. Um, and when I'm not working, I also am a dog mom and so I'm hiking and with my dogs, we actually were just at um, John Bryan just a couple weeks ago and this past weekend we um, hiked the Simon Kitten Trace, so yeah. Uh, thank you for having us, and I look forward to our conversation today. Awesome. Thank you, Lindsay. So as you all know, Vesper Energy is responsible for the Kingwood Solar Project. Um, but for those of you who do not know, Vesper Energy is a U.S.-based renewable energy developer, owner, and operator. We were founded in 2015 under the name Lendlease Energy Development. Our parent company, Lendlease Energy, or Lendlease, it's not a very familiar name, but you might recognize some of their more notable works in the United States. Mm -hmm. They're responsible for developing Trump Towers in Chicago and the 9-11 Memorial in Manhattan. Um, oh. Yeah, <laughs> interesting, right? Um, so the success of Lendlease Energy Development led to an acquisition by Magnetar Capital, a US-based capital investment firm, in 2020. That, in, that acquisition enabled Vesper Energy to become what it is today. Um, it allowed us to grow the business and continue developing projects and shift into an owner and operator structure. Um, we have the same core leadership team that we had from the early days as Lendlease Energy Development. And one thing that's really notably changed in our business model is we've invested really deeply in community engagement. We have a robust community engagement or community affairs team, one of the remote, most robust teams in the industry. Um, that's a direct testament of Vesper's commitment to 
deep, thoughtful engagement with the communities which host our projects and the value we place in local knowledge. Our community affairs director, Jackie, is in the back of the room. Feel free to say hello at the end of, end of the evening. So as you all know, we're here tonight to talk about the Aviation Energy Center. This is a new proposed project. Um, we're exploring siting opportunities right now in the Miami Township, Xenia Township, and Cedarville Townships. Our project would utilize an existing interconnection agreement with PJM to connect to the electrical grid along the Clark and Green 138 KV transmission line right here in the Miami Township. This interconnection agreement is an asset. It's a product of rigorous multi-year studies conducted by PJM and allows for up to 175 megawatts to be injected into the electrical grid locally. However, the actual size of Aviation Energy Center has yet to be determined. Our goal for this project is to design it in collaboration with our community partners, and that's why we're here this evening. We are here to introduce the project and solicit feedback from the township trustees and the public on really everything about this project, siting, um, design considerations, like should we incorporate agrivoltaics? Um, how far should the setbacks be from infrastructure? Should we, vegetative screenings, all of those design considerations. We are, Lindsay's gonna talk a little bit more about our community uh, giving program, but we're here to solicit feedback on where those funds should be distributed. Um, engagement preferences, how do you all want to be engaged with by Vesper Energy? So we're looking for feedback on all of these things tonight. We have been engaging with the community for the past year, Lindsay mainly, and we've learned that setbacks are a priority, so we are committed to 300 foot setbacks for the Aviation Energy Center project, to 300 foot setbacks from public roads, residential property lines, state parks, and public lands. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Lindsay to talk about the work she's been doing in the community to date. Thank you, Hannah. As she mentioned, I've been here for the past year. I've met, like I said, many of you throughout that time, and I've been able to engage with over 25 organizations throughout the community, many of which are located right here in Miami Township. And um, through that process, I've heard the feedback about the project, about you know what Vesper should do and could do, and that's, like she said, that we're here to listen and we're here to figure out there's a way to move forward with you guys right along with us. Um, our engagement to date has been pretty robust. It has just been me. I'm very happy to have Hannah now, so I can kind of put some, some of the work on her. Um, but I, I, I very much appreciate just the heart and the soul of this community. It's very evident that you guys care about the land and that you care about where you live, and we do too. We want to be good neighbors. We want to do things right, and we want to do right by you. And so, yeah, that's kind of where we're at with this. We've already been working with a few different organizations. For instance, our community giving program has given over $20,000 to um, different organizations throughout the community, notably the um, Camp Clifton 4-H Camp and the John Bryan State Parks. They, um, they have testimonials. They weren't able to be here tonight, but we do have their testimonials if, if anyone would like to hear those. And we're looking forward to continuing those partnerships in a more um, robust way. I just recently toured the great council house that's getting built, and I'm very excited about it. It's, it's going to be a great addition to the community. And um, as uh, hopefully we can work with you guys on, on continuing to build up this community to be as great as it can be. So. Yeah. And we would, as she mentioned, we are here to solicit feedback. We are here to, 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 to hear if you think we should be having, you know, quarterly block parties or whatever you think is the best thing for us to do. We want to do that. We want to be good neighbors and we want to listen. We want to take what you say to heart and make sure that we can implement in a way that is meaningful and substantial for both sides, for both of us. Yeah, and we can host public listening sessions. Yeah. We can engage in this format if that's the preference. We're open to one-on-one -on -one meetings. So we'd really love to hear from you all about how you prefer to be engaged with. Yeah. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, um, we have a community giving program. It is, um, the Q4 is actually just, just ending up right now. Um, it's, it's for us, it's a way for us to, to give to programs in the community that are already making a difference and for us to kind of plug in where we're needed to help support those causes and those, those organizations that are really vital to 
the community. And if you guys have any suggestions on who we should be talking to for that, I I would love to hear them. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, the the recipients this last quarter were the um, Camp Clifton 4-H Camp and the John Bryan State Park. I don't know if any of you have been out there, but we uh, we we sponsored two water refill stations right in right in the state park. And so with Camp Clifton, I believe we're, we're repairing their septic system. So anything we can do to ensure that the, the organizations are run smoothly and are able to help more citizens and more residents of the community, we want to do. So please, if you have more questions about the community giving program, please come to me after. I can, I'm more than happy to talk more about it and more than happy to put you in the right place to get those funds to the organizations that you think might need them. So. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah. And Lindsay and Jackie have done a phenomenal job. It's such an easy application. If you go to our website, you can fill out an application. The funds are distributed quarterly, and you're able to reapply if you're if you get funds, or if not, you're, you can reapply as many times as your organization mm -hmm. needs. Um, but our community giving program is not the only way our solar project would benefit this community. We Ohio has a pilot program that we would plan to participate in that would give $9,000 per megawatt of installed capacity to the county. $7,000 of that would be distributed across the jurisdictions where there's land in the project. Um, the additional $2,000 or remaining $2,000 would go to the county's general fund. Um, we would also, we would expect actually that the pilot program alone to generate millions of dollars for the Miami Township over the life of the project. We'd also expect millions of dollars in landowner payments to those landowners who participate in these projects. During the construction period, over 100 jobs would be created. These are estimate numbers on a you know, roughly 100 megawatt facility. But as I mentioned before, the size of this project is flexible. So the numbers would shift a little bit. But that's what we would expect on, in this ballpark. Um, and solar is compatible with an agricultural community like Miami Township. The um, preservation of agricultural land, solar panels preserve, sorry, solar panels preserve agricultural land uh, by protecting against residential development and commercial development, as well as resting the soil beneath the panels, um, allowing for additional carbon sequestration into the soil, uh, Vesper is committed to agrivoltaics, so if that's of interest to the community, we'd love to incorporate that into this project as well to maximize the carbon sequestration ability of the land. Um, additionally, we are keeping farmers farming. These landowner payments offer a way for farmers to offset the volatility of weather and commodity markets by providing a steady, reliable income stream. Um, this is something Lindsay and I are obviously really passionate about. Um, these are the end of our prepared remarks, but I do invite you all to check out our project website, www.aviationenergycenter.com. You can learn more about our project. You can learn facts about solar projects. We brought a lot of fact sheets as well. <laughs> and Lindsay and I are a resource for you all. We're here to support you in learning about solar. It's a really complex industry. Anyone who says they know it all, they're probably not telling the truth. Um, so we're here to be a resource for you, address questions, um, and encourage anyone who's interested to apply to our community grant program. Yes. I have some questions. Yeah, are, is that okay? Yeah. Um, yes, Muller, um, <coughs> Sharon Muller. Um, how are you intending to keep the foliage from growing up around this? That's a great question. Yeah, I've herbicides. I'm sorry? Herbicides. herbicides. Yeah, sometimes herbicides are used. Vesper mm -hmm. Energy, though, is committed to using environmentally friendly. Sheep? Um, yeah, sheep is one way. That's so is that, is that the plan for this? Um, facility? It really depends. So Vesper as a company is rolling out agrivoltaics, including sheep grazing, on our projects. Um, but for this project, it really depends. If that's something that we hear the community wants, we'll absolutely consider that. Well, I have another question. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think solar is absolutely necessary, but I don't see why you don't plan on putting it on already despoiled land, like 
for <laughs> quarries and parking lots. Yeah, and that's instead of uh, agriculture or land, because the world mm -hmm. is getting very hungry, mm -hmm. and we are very lucky to live in these lake states where we are. We have water, we have good soil, and we can grow food for the world here. And it's not a good idea to just cover it up and and, and not be able to produce food here. And uh, you say, well, it's temporary. But I'm thinking that my little great-granddaughter will be 46 years old when uh, that's when they're not there anymore. Yeah. And we are absolutely interested in exploring brownfield opportunities. If there are sites folks have in mind, we've been in communication with the Xenia Township and their administrator offered um, sites. brownfield sites for us to explore. What we found is that they're not large enough to site really any megawattage. Um, so that's kind of the challenge that we face, that we're looking for sites that have, that have to meet. meet and, the, and this wattage, mm -hmm. uh, it's just going into the grid. It's not going to benefit the people in Green County it necessarily. Depends. Yeah, so electricity flows where the demand, it goes where the demand is. It goes where the best price is. Sort of, but uh -huh. it's also managed by grid operators who distribute energy where there's demand. So electrons don't know where they're getting sent. They just mm -hmm. flow to the mm -hmm. path of least resistance. Go to the biggest bidder. Well, potentially. I'm not an electrical engineer, but if we want to host a listening session or a learning session, we could bring in our electrical engineers to talk more about the flow of electricity on our transmission grid. I don't know anything about that <laughs> Well, we could I learn together. But you should, you should know. You should be able. I don't yeah. care about the technicalities of it. Yeah. I, I think that the, looking at the history, I'm old, and I, my mother, uh, I'm 85. My mother was very, very concerned about all of the strip mines and how little the coal companies had to do to fix things. Mm -hmm. And just reading yesterday about the mountaintop mining in West Virginia, no, Nobody has ever yeah. made them repair that yet. And I am very antsy about dealing with big energy. And that's what you are. Yeah. yeah, and I feel you. I am a passionate environmentalist. That is why I got into this industry. And unfortunately, the oil and gas industry have, coal especially, have done a lot of damage. They have not reclaimed their land. Mm -hmm. We put into place decommissioning bonds so that the money is set aside at the project start, the operations date, to remove those facilities when that time comes. Um, and then additionally, I've written into leases that we will not use glyphosate, which I can't pronounce, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> we won't use Round environmentally up. hazardous, just, what was it? Roundup. Round 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 yes, yeah. Yeah. Round up. We've written that into leases that we won't use that on our facilities. So if that is something that the community cares about, I know I care about that. We can make that. it happen. Yeah. We can absolutely consider that. Could I just real quick, you just said uh, bonds for yeah, retirement? Yeah, bonds. Because that was not in the previous proposal. Yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Um, it most likely was included in there. We call it, though, remediation bonds oftentimes. So they're usually like either remediation bonds or decommissioning bonds. They have a couple of other yeah. words for I, them. I may have misunderstood, but okay. I understood that there was that the cash was not down for decommission bonds. Yeah. But oh, we don't oh, need to argue with that. No, that's Have that okay. in the future would be great. At least now all of our projects include decommissioning mm -hmm. bonds. I can't speak to, you know, the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Lisa Abel and then Ben Crandall. Hi. Um, and maybe I missed um, the intro to this in another meeting, but I, I guess I would like you to maybe take a step back and explain to us why this area and, and what percent of, of ag land are you, I mean, I know you have a range of acres you're kind of thinking okay. about, but so that we can get a better I mean, sense of really how, it, yeah. why you're coming back mm -hmm. and looking at this again and then what kind of land are you, what percentage of ag land are you really thinking about? Yeah, so why this area, um, and I'm just jotting down here the questions I don't get. Um, we have an interconnection agreement in hand 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you want me? Is it, can we face the camera? Yeah. So sorry. <laughs> sorry. <Lisa. laughs> um, so okay. why this area? We have an interconnection agreement in hand with PJM. So that's just a place where you can connect with the grid. So that's simply, and it's up by those big transmission lines that cross. Yeah. The so it's the actually the interconnection agreement is the contract between the customer, the developer, Vesper and the either utility or regional transmission operator. In our case, it's the RTO, regional transmission operator, mm -hmm. and that's PJM. So we've gone through the interconnection process, which we have a 101 sheet on the interconnection process. It's extremely complex. It's different in every region. Um, but the interconnection process is notoriously cumbersome and long. Mm -hmm. It's where PJM studies our project and the injection of that amount of megawatts onto the electrical grid to see what happens when you put that much energy on that grid at that location, what failures result. Just like an electrical uh, circuit breaker in your house, if you plug too many things in one outlet, you're gonna pop a breaker. Uh, that, if there's an electrical engineer in the room that wants to give a better analogy, that's how I think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but we have already gone through that study process We've negotiated an agreement with PJM, and so we have this asset, which is that interconnection agreement. It would take years mm -hmm. to, for another company to start today. The average queue time is about five years. Mm -hmm. So for another company that came out to Green County today, if they were just getting into the interconnection queue, mm -hmm. they would not have an interconnection agreement for about five years, depending. And there's a way to get into the queue right now as well, so. Yeah, so there's a whole, fact sheet on this. Um, I'm happy to talk in greater detail or host an education session on this topic with an electrical engineer <laughs> present so they can verify everything I say. Um, so you have an asset, right? Yeah. And there are copies of this over yes. there. Yes, and there are two pages, just FYI. Um, but yeah, so that's to your first question. So you have an asset, and it's yes. like a gold ticket to the grid. Exactly. Yes. Like, like Kingwood, it was so far denied. And if you leave the area, you leave that asset. Yeah, right. so the asset. interconnection agreement isn't project specific. Mm -hmm. It can be recycled, so to speak. Um, and that's what we would hope to utilize. But it doesn't say, you know, you have to put the solar panels right by that interconnection point. So we have flexibility on siting, on design. The constraint we face is we can only uh, build up to 175 megawatts because that's what we've agreed to with PJM. And the question about what percentage of ag land. We are flexible on siting. So if there's a site that has poor quality soils that we should look into, or a brownfield site, or anything like that, we're happy to explore those opportunities. Um, a typical like rule of thumb for solar developers is we look for five to 10 acres per megawatt. Uh, we usually start by leasing the, on the 10 side, 10 acres per megawatt. And then we have to study all of the constraints that take land out off the table. Um, so hydrology, topography, the geotechnical constraints, environmental constraints, all of those things reduce the amount of land we can actually build on. So at the end of the day, the panels only end up being sited on about five acres per megawatt. Is that? So, but in this, in this region, if you were talking about up to 175 or 150 or 100 megawatt, <laughs> Of the ag land in the in the region that you could access, what percent? More or less, is it five percent? Is it five percent? Is it you know what's? I don't know. Okay, but I can yeah. tell you nationally, there's a bit of misinformation about the amount of land ag land that's being taken out of production due to solar. Um, it's a common trope of of opposition groups. What we what not we Vesper, but the industry has found is residential and commercial development is taking about 3% of agricultural land out of production every year annually, whereas solar is taking less than 1%. I can, I believe actually we might have a fact sheet on this. Mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. I see it in the pile, it's a new one. We just have made with a lot of graphs, so we can definitely, if anybody wants that, give me your email address, we'll make sure you get it out yeah. mm -hmm. tonight. But at the county level, I'm not sure. Um, I think that calculation. Yeah, the yeah. county yeah. GIS yeah. database is amazingly robust, so we can mm -hmm. probably get you a number. Ben Crandall? Yeah, I got a few points. I'll try to make them quick. Um, mostly comments, a quick question at the end. 
Uh, so I've been studying solar energy for most of my life. I was gonna, I started college over 20 years ago as a chemical <coughs> engineer because I wanted to get into the solar energy. So, and I've been an investor for most of my life as well. So I, I understand the industry both on the policy level and on the, on the technical level pretty well. Um, so the first thing I want to say is the interconnection thing is a big deal because it's like the big limiting factor. Like we all know that we need to go renewable for climate change and other reasons. And the interconnection is like the, one of the biggest limiting factors. Um, there's other geopolitical things in terms of the price of panels are way too expensive in the US because of our policy, but that's us put that aside. Um, but the interconnection thing, it's like there's not a lot of great opportunity options for geographically for the interconnection. And so there's a reason why that has to be prioritized for us to transition as quickly as possible. Um, and so if there's an opportunity here, I personally think that's a good thing to look into. In terms of the uh, impact on agriculture, agriculture is getting disrupted significantly over the next decade, couple of decades. First of all, 40 million acres of ethanol is going to go away as we transition to EVs. So that's a huge amount of land that already is going to get taken out of agriculture into corn ethanol. Then there's this, there's some other more technical food stuff that I could get into. There's like, the, there's some new technologies that are going to displace a lot of animal agriculture, and that's another side thing. But that's going to also displace lots of agricultural land. So, I personally don't think the argument of like, we need that land for agriculture. I think that that's the past, but I don't think that's where we're headed as a as a culture and as an economy. Um, solar for it to really displace the other fuels we're using, it has to be low cost. And so like the more we do debate this kind of thing, this adds to the cost. The more they're spending on community engagement and you know grants and all the rest of it. Like, I mean, personally, I think like we just need to be building solar and we need to be building it uh, in an environmentally sustainable way and like as quick as possible. Like, that's my personal feeling. And, um, and so like the more hoops we make people jump in through, the more expensive it is for everybody and the less solar we end up getting installed nationally. And then thinking about where those electrons are end, ended up using, whether they're used in our community or elsewhere, it's like energy is energy. And like we, it, it doesn't matter which electrons go where. Like that's, uh, it makes absolutely no difference. It drives down the cost for everybody as we get lower costs. You know, solar is the lowest, form, lowest cost form of energy. The more solar there is, the lower the cost of electricity for everybody. And so like the more we scale it up, the quicker we scale it up, the cheaper everybody's electricity gets, including ours. Um, so, and then I guess the last thing I'd have to say is, I, I agree with the pesticide issue. I don't want pesticides getting into our water. And um, so whatever way we can do to make sure that there's no pesticides getting, you know. Herbicides. Herbicides, yeah, herbicides, thank you. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, Okay. Just a quick comment on the herbicide issue. Please. I care about that also. Teresa um, Borchers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Teresa Borchers. And, and just to, to comment, we live across from a large amount of farmland and have experienced being sitting outside and helicopters coming down and spraying and having a cloud of poison. Um, my husband and I were farmers outside of this area before that and neighbors sprayed all over. I feel like I would be less exposed to herbicides and pesticides by having the controlled environment of the solar farms. The other thing is that my husband and I were farmers up in Shelby County. As many young farmers, we financially couldn't make a go of it during the farmer's crisis. It was a horrible experience to go through. I so support anything that enables family farmers to continue to farm and, and to have uh, a steady source of income is just so valuable if we want to protect our farmers. So I really support this. Robert, I'm sorry, turn around. Yeah. Very, <laughs> much <laughs> much <laughs> very much so. Are you Robert? Yes. Sweet. Thank you. Um, Sweet. Yeah, I, I very much support uh, <coughs> the idea of solar, but I like the idea of setbacks from the road. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's really important in this community because our community depends a lot on <coughs> tourism. Right. But I want to know, um, you said that that's going to happen. But if you find that you can't afford it and you don't do it, what's our recourse? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Because that happens a lot in environmental building that people promise a building is going to be super green and then they take it all out as they build. Um, do you mean, so well, when we develop a project, we would build the setbacks into the design from 
as early as the, the beginning. first design. Well, my question is, if you change the design because of cost overruns, what do we do? <laughs> Can it be changed because of cost overruns? I was gonna say, that's I what I'm think thinking that. about in my head is we get to, you get so far into the design where you're really not making that, types of that type of change, mm -hmm. what would probably get sacrificed is the production of the facility. So rather than being a 100 megawatt facility, it drops down to a 75% or 75 megawatt facility because we just lost that land yeah. to the setback. Um, but our contracts, we could write that into a lease agreement and be legally binding. So we'd mm -hmm. have to figure out a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And so I do think if you're gonna promise that kind of thing, it ought to be in the lease agreement. Yeah, and it can be, yeah. yeah. But I really support the project. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. yeah. And I want to also just add to Hannah what she what she said. Um, we heard about what I, we've been hearing. We know that setbacks are important to you, not just from the roads, from the, from the Little Miami River, and we are committed to those. Yeah. That is something that we decided from the beginning when we decided when we were talking about a new project. That was a, a priority. So I I think I can confidently say that's something that we are committed to. And we will adhere to the setbacks. And is it part of the permit process? Like we're permitted mm -hmm. something, is it baked in? Yes, yeah. I, mean, I it appreciate is. your commitment, but I think it should be written in. Well, it will be. It absolutely will be, yeah. <laughs> we'll make sure of it. And yeah, yeah to your point, Marilyn, the permitting process would also tie our hands to whatever was in the design. Yeah. Um, Teresa, did you have a follow-up? Just, but I don't have the details of this, but my understanding is that the Ohio Power Sitting Board recently updated requirements for solar development and includes Specifications for setbacks, egg fencing, no chain link fences, visual screening, pollinator habitat, drainage monitoring repair, noise studies, and other kinds of requirements. Mm -hmm. And then they've also developed a good neighbor agreement program, which provides some compensation or benefit to neighbors for disruption of, uh, due to construction and some aesthetic changes, and that's best practice in the developmental process mm -hmm. and something that we should ask for. So. Just on that, that is something Vesper has committed to in the past, um, and we will continue to. And um, we would be beholden to it yeah. for OPSC permitting. Yeah. But we were doing it before then. Do you know what, you know what the required setbacks are at this time? Are they there? 50? I want to say that it got increased. It was 50 at one point. I think they upped it in this latest. Um, but our, the 300 is much greater. It's well beyond yeah. the requirement. And again, that was something that we, we were very adamant about when we were talking about a new project, particularly the Little Miami watershed. We wanted to make sure that it was as far back as possible. So. But I can provide more information on the OPSC permitting process if you'd like to follow up with an email. Thank you. And the Aviation Energy Center one pager, so about this new project, again, we're still in design. There isn't an exact size or exact location, but that is written in here. There's also some other information on pollinators and sheep and mm -hmm. some links to websites. Um, so some good information here. So if you didn't grab that, please grab it on your way out. And our website also has an open yeah. forum for asking questions. Um, so if you think of something later this evening. Yeah. Um, um, anybody besides Sharon? Oh, we better give some other people. Yes. Yeah. Lamar Spracklin? Yes. Okay. I have a question for the trustees. My concern is uh, property rights. I've worked uh, 50, 60 years, and I don't like to admit it, but <clears throat> uh, to buy a farm, I think I should have the right to do what I want with it. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm not here to vote in favor or uh, against. Uh, my, my concern is property rights and I would like to ask the trustees, how much money did you allot to pay lawyers to fight this? Do you have a total done? Initially it was 15000 and uh, right now it's open-ended. I think we've done another 3000 so at this point, 18000 Open-ended? We didn't, didn't make another after the 15000 uh, when it got into the appeals, know. we don't have a, we don't we haven't set a limit. Yeah, and I, I understand about the property rights, Lamar. However, zone the nature of zoning is determining what we do. I mean, do you have do you have the right to put a hundred houses on your land? Do you have the right to put a McDonald's? Up? I mean, at some point we we've decided as a society we have zoning, and that. 
we put the public interest and in, in some planning thought in it. But I, I understand what you're saying, so I don't see how I don't see how solar is different than other types of zoning. But well, uh, I mean, we, we I can't uh, do anything. I won't my property uh, in the city. Zoning, uh, we can put uh, solar in there, except for the siding board. They they decided no, and the trustees have decided because of their personal opinion, in my opinion, to pay a, a lawyers to fight this. Like I say, I'm not in favor of it. I have no contracts with the solar, That's but I don't think I it's right for the trustees, because of their personal opinions, to use taxpayer money, my money, to pay lawyers to fight, fight it. Marco. Thank you, Lamar. Drew, do you want to? Yes, just, just on that subject, may I please ask, I guess it's a matter of public record, what is the hourly rate that the attorneys are being paid? What's their, I what's don't their, remember. What's I their have, billing rate? I have to look that can, up. I, um, I could recent email. probably find a, a bill. Uh, I can send you an email, but that doesn't answer it in public. That's, yeah, that yeah. You have hired somebody and you don't know the rate per hour? Is that at the, right? At the time we did, and I don't remember it. Um, Craig Chick. Jim. What was your first name? Jim. Uh, it's, all the stuff is just a uh, uh, Dalton County show. I mean, we've heard the same thing over and over from this is be about the sixth project manager on this thing. It's about the third company's ownership on this thing. We're talking about lawyers. I go to Columbus and each township has a one lawyer representing them. And a lot of them donated a lot of their time and because the townships are strapped. And when I go to Columbus, there's a team of lawyers that Vesper comes in and another room on behind that room with a whole body of people on uh, laptops doing this. So they had a team of about 12 or 20 attorneys and we had one per township. So don't go into, it cost us anything. All this stuff is costing us more time and sacrificing our time and efforts to not do away with solar. This has never been an issue with me, and, and I've tried to make this clear, is I'm not against solar. I'm against play, where the proper places to put this stuff is, yeah. how to implement it, put them on rooftops, Incorporate, take the government money that all these Vesper, the Vesper and all these other solar companies are giving and build materials out of these homes, these factories, the glass, the rooftops, streets, between the medium strips, all these things. Take the extra money, that, but quit giving the tax dollars to these Megatar hedge fund companies, the only reason they're in this thing is because there's a lot of money to be made. It's heavily subsidized. If it didn't have money to be made, they wouldn't be in this thing. Give it to give it to Lamar if he wants to put solar up. Give it to him and he can put 25 acres out there for his personal use and sell it back to the grid. Let the state do that. Let Mike DeWine uh, come up with some stuff and our local farmers save them. But there's not one farmer in this room and there's not one farmer in this whole solar proposal that is, su that is suffering uh, financially. There's not. There's four fifth generation farmers in here. It is, and it's about the money to them too. It's not about uh, uh, preserving farmland. I think it's for the next opportunity to take that cash and go buy more $10,000 an acre ground. Yeah. That's all this is, it's money. Uh, my name is Scott Fife, um, and I, if this is not an appropriate time to do this, I'll be happy to let you drive the rescheduling, but I actually have comments I'd like to make to the, the trustees. 
It's not a question for Vesper. Okay. Uh, if you'd rather me do that later, that's that's quite that's, right. That's fine now. All right. Um, uh, I have been closely following this issue since it since it came up, and um, it's been just monumentally disappointing to me. Um, of course, the outcome was disappointing, but even more disappointing to me was the, the process by which it happened. Um, I thought, well, we've got this power siding board. We're going to have testimony. We're going to have facts introduced. People are going to be evaluating the arguments pro and con. It's going to be a rational decision. And it was none of that. It was absolutely none of that. Um, the vaunted meeting that the county commissioners held on November 15th of 21, where hundreds of people got up to speak, uh, and the power siding board was there, all they did was make check marks in the column of whether people spoke for or against. It didn't make any difference what, what you said. It was, were you for or were you against? And I would encourage you as, as trustees of our township to be better than that. I hope you'll apply reason and logic. I hope you'll make every effort to get the full opinion of as many of your constituents as possible. I appreciated your introduction, Mr. Moocher. Uh, and the background on all of that, I understand you're playing with, with your hands tied behind your back. But please do not allow this to be a case where the loudest voice in the room gets taken to be uh, the facts or the opinions of the residents of Miami Township. I don't think it is. Uh, I think what we saw in the, in the previous case, the Kingwood case, where we had, and I've said this a number of times, a very well-organized opposition group who spoke loudly and often, but 200 people is the number that's frequently cited as to, as to how many people there were. And that represents, I'll let you do the math on that, what 200 people represents as a percentage of 269,000, which is the population of Greene County. Uh, I really believe, and I have some experience of late, with a, a very thorny public policy problem we had concerning our school district. Uh, and as all of you know, it was divisive, it was agonizing, and eventually I believe one of the things that helped us resolve that was we did some surveying. We, we got into the, the, the thick of it with people and said, please tell us what are your thoughts about this specifically, not just for and against. Um, so I would hope that we'll see something of that kind from, from you, our township trustees. Uh, I didn't move here because the community was regressive. I wanted to live in a progressive place that looked to the future, that looked toward, um, that looked at the big picture. And so all of this talk of, well, you know, if we aren't going to get to use the electricity, it's, you know, that's, that's meaningless. It, electricity is a commodity. Uh, 35 years or 37 years may seem like a long time, but believe me, it's inside that window of the point of no return. And I, for one, be believe the scientists when they tell us that we've got to do everything we can, everything we can, in order to address this climate change problem now. I, I would hope you'll be able to navigate the trickiness of this and make this a problem to be solved rather than blame to be laid and let's let's work with Vesper or who whatever company is willing to work with us uh, and let's work with the folks that are against this and and but let's we ought to be able to do better than was done before it was the previous experience was a, was a disgrace and and um, that's what I have to say so the, well, the what the township trustees are determining are whether or not we're going to weigh in as interveners. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as large solar goes, that's, that's, you see our, we also, we don't have a, a specific plan. What do you mean? I mean, intervener is way beyond where we're at now. There's a new, yeah. new plan being proposed. Uh, your, relationship and presentation is totally different mm -hmm. than what we got three or four years ago. Uh, 
and who knows, you know, maybe collaboration, the process you're advocating, uh, we'll come up with something different. We're here for that, that's but, why we're here. But still, the township doesn't mediate that. I mean, no. I, I understand. I, I'm, yeah. I'm just encouraging you to try and set an example here. Let's let's be better than what we saw from Columbus. Uh, the politicization of the of the whole power siting process scares me to death. Uh, you know, there might be a reason why those kinds of things weren't initially done by townships and counties. And you know, the Green County commissioners talk about preserving agricultural land. And where are they all from? Oh yes, Beaver Creek. Anybody's driven over to Beaver Creek lately knows they're not too worried about preserving agricultural land from residential development, are they? Um, thank you for listening. Kate Lovecant? Yes. Um, I'm going to echo a few points, and I am newer to this dialogue, diving in. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that the first thing I'd like to say is I support the idea of solar because we're in a climate emergency. Because 2023, the United Nations has determined is the hottest year on record again. Um, <clears throat> so I like the idea of having a utility-sized solar uh, farm here in Miami County. Uh, I know that it will bring uh, income to us, that it will be helpful. I know that it's a non-polluting business despite, to my understanding so far, despite uh, claims to the opposite. Um, and I do think solar can help small farmers retain their small farms and that that is not insignificant. Um, <clears throat> not to mention the agrivoltaics uh, uh, option of combining the two, which more and more, as I read, is becoming a more common practice and a useful way to uh, have the benefit of agriculture and the benefit of solar. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, I recommend a few things that I have read. Uh, Farmer's Guide to Going Solar is published by the United States Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. I found it very edifying regarding those uh, claims. Uh, uh, the Electric Power Research Institute report on solar power safety for farmland. I recommend, I'll send these comments in to the trustees. Um, and uh, the uh, November 30th, 2022 uh, Forbes uh, article titled Fossil Fuel Funded Opposition is Blocking America's Clean Energy Transition. I recommend, was very edifying for me. Um, I'd like to comment just briefly about uh, the idea that solar farms should not be placed on farmland. Um, it is true that farmland is decreasing, but the primary problem is urbanization. So trustees and zoning people have the opportunity to help curb urbanization, which is the primary danger. The primary reason we are losing farmland, other than climate change, is uh, urban sprawl. And I recommend to everyone who has a concern about farmland preservation, the idea that the important thing to look at is how do we curb that urban sprawl. And I think that zoning and township might be able to play an important role there. Um, so those are my, my main points, and I appreciate the trustees' attention. You said you would share links to those articles? I will. I will send that in my comments. Um, Lauren Shouse. Yes, thanks. Um, I have some questions that are, you may have already answered, and I just didn't hit the details, and it's all logistical and timeline. So, so the interconnection agreement with P PJM, when was that instituted? What year? I don't want to misquote. Can I follow up with sure. it back there? Yeah. Uh, but was it? But it was before. Um, yes. Yeah, so before was, Kingwood started work. Yes. That's all. Yeah. Well, before a, they went applied for a permit. Yeah. Gotcha. So Kingwood is still being considered before the Ohio uh, Supreme Court, or no? Yes. Um, yeah. So if it is denied, then this will go ahead. Is that the idea? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, so we are bound to a 175 megawatt project right. or projects. 
there could be two smaller projects that move gotcha. forward. There could okay. be one project. Um, if we obtain the OPSB permit for Kingwood, we can apply all the design considerations that we can be receiving the community to that project okay. instead. Um, it's really a matter of what the community wants mm -hmm. and how we can best okay. incorporate that. And then, um, last question, if, hold on, it kind of went out of my head. I guess if, if Kingwood is denied mm -hmm. and we go ahead with a new project, will the same process, will we be going through the same process that we went through with Kingwood? Will it be the same? Well, it takes six, five or six years again. That's a great question. We hope not, right? Yeah. We would That's hope, the plan. We would hope that we would apply for a permit application and we wouldn't have as many interveners or as much opposition mm -hmm. um, because we would have designed that project and back to the community from day one. I appreciate it. That's what I do want to add on that just real quick. We do, we will still have to hold two public hearings. So gotcha. the voices yeah. of the people will still be heard even if this is word, we will still have to hold two public hearings. Plenty of opportunity for feedback and for comments. And we would hope to hold many more meetings yes, that, right. uh, yeah. while we design this new project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Michelle Burns of Drake can say up to come to the lantern. Sure, yeah. yeah. I'm here in my official capacity. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so most of our um, concerns were laid out in our public comments. Mm -hmm. um, so you all have seen those. So just to say, though, I really appreciate Kate's comment about urbanization and that being the biggest threat, because it is. But I also just want to throw out there that, you know, staying away from our prime soils would be, of course, our biggest concern, because not all soil is created equally. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as energy is energy, soil is not soil, and it is a finite resource. So I always just like to remind people that um, it's a resource just like any other water, um, anything else. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to just <coughs> one clarification on the, the process that we went through for the Ohio Power Siting Board, if I could. So I'm sorry this isn't directed to you guys. No but worries. Um, and, and particularly in that idea of having to hire a lawyer, I mean, to be in a, to have a seat at the table at the power siting board, the only way to do that is to be what's called an intervener. Whether you take a stand on the issue or don't, where such as Tecumseh Land Trust was an intervener, although we did not have a stand on the issue, but we wanted a seat at the table. And you do really need to hire an attorney to, to be able to do that function. And so it may be unfortunate that all these townships and the counties had to do that, but um, it, it is a legal process, and you are giving sworn testimony, and so it's very nice to have legal representation. I just kind of wanted to mention that because the process is kind of obscure, um, and um, but it, you know, I I thought it was worthwhile to have a seat at the table, and so I just wanted to make that clarification. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking for someone who hasn't spoken yet. Uh, Drew Deal, again? Well, I could speak. Look, I'm going to ask. I live in Cincinnati. I don't live here. I grew up here. I'd like to say something, but I'm going to leave it up to the people who are opposed to this project. If you, I'm going to speak in favor of it. But if you don't want me to, I won't, because I'm not in the, I don't belong to the township. It, it's so very general. I mean, it's a, it's a topic that needs to be discussed in the, the best places to implement solar. I mean, so you're more welcome. I, I'm encouraged. If you're okay, because I'm, you know, I'm an interloper at this point. I grew up here, but that was a long time ago, okay. as you can tell. Okay, well, I'll, I'm going to skip my remarks here. I'm just going to say that um, I've been following this for a couple of years, and Everybody sitting up there knows what I'm going to say. But basically, my point is that um, climate change is real. It's happening now. The science is clear. Um, we are in the beginning stages of a radical change in climate throughout the climates, throughout the Earth, which will last for thousands of years. This is of a historic consequence. And the science is clear that it's due to human activity. It's primarily because we're putting too many greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which block the solar radiation from once it hits the Earth and goes, tries to go back into space, it blocks it from going back into space. 
That's why some people call it a greenhouse effect. It's like putting an extra blanket around. And what happens here, or whether it's admitted in China, or India, or Green County, or whatever, the same gases are going to go around the whole atmosphere for the next 100 years or so. It doesn't matter where it comes from. So it's a global problem that has to be solved locally. We can't control what China does, and I don't trust China, but we can control what we do. As someone said, this is the hottest year on record in at least 125,000 years. Sea levels are rising. Agriculture around the world is being threatened. It's being literally too hot for some places for people to live. The United Nations is projecting in the next 20 years or so, climate-related migration demand of around a half a billion people who are going to be trying to leave where they don't have water, they don't have food, or it's too damn hot. And who's going to take them? The ocean is getting warmer. It's reaching the point where it can't take in any more carbon dioxide. The water's going acidic. The coral reefs are disappearing. Everything is up for grabs right now. Sea levels rising. Our own coasts are threatened. It's a crisis. It's an existential crisis, but it has to be addressed locally. And so I think when anybody <coughs> considers a solar project, they have to do it in that perspective. It should be assumed that the project should go through unless there's a good reason why it shouldn't. And I don't see a good reason here. And I agree that this community can work cooperatively to come up with something that's great, that we can all be proud of, and that respects the concerns of local people. I think we can do that. The one thing I don't like is the name of this project. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck is the, what is it, the? Aviation Energy Center. Aviation Energy Center. To me, that's the General Electric jet airplane, you know, jet engine production site in Evendale. Or that could be, apparently, the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base National Museum for the aerospace. That's going solar. That should be what should be referred to as the aviation energy thing. I think this is something that the county should, could be proud of. It could be an asset. It can bring people in with everything else. So I think the name should be the Green County Solar Farm or, or Field. The Green County Solar Field. We can something that yeah, we can, I mean, We're here for feedback. So. Yeah. <laughs> like as I said, this is my last point. As I said to somebody else today, in the nuclear industry, they don't want to be known as somebody who might have explosions. So in the, nu in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission language, there's no such thing as an explosion at a nuclear power plant. Instead, it's called an energetic disassembly. <laughs> well, to me, the Aviation Energy Service Center, or whatever it is, I mean, what the heck is that? You should be, we should be proud, or you should be proud, shout it out, say, this is the Green County Solar Field, and be proud of it. Hold it out as an asset, not as something to be hidden. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to say that I'm really excited that we have the potential to create a design that takes into account our, our preferences and our concerns. And one of mine that I'm personally excited about and personally want to see what I think other people do too is a combination of agriculture and solar. I think that yes. they, I mean, based on my research, I think they can go together. And it's probably not going to look like row crops like we have now, but it's still agriculture. Yes. And I really would like to see that. I'm, and I am really excited by that. Yeah. I also am, I guess, excited. That's three times I've used that word. <laughs> but I'm also excited that we have the chance to develop something that I think is truly innovative a project, 
that will inspire others and can be used around the state as a model and maybe even across the country, you know, for other places that have similar climates, similar things going on, you know, rain patterns and temperature patterns. Like, we can be a leader in something. Like that, I find that really exciting. <laughs> that Ohio, we, Ring County could be a leader in Ohio and Ohio could be a leader in the country. That's exciting to me. Okay, four times. Okay. Five. Five. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I just say something? Yes. Okay. I'm going off of that. So again, Jackie Friedley, and I am with Vesper. I'm the director of community engagement. I just want to say, it was mentioned earlier. You know, there's two, you know, hearings that you have to have. And I think for a long time that was sort of what the industry in general, Vesper, I believe, during Kingwood. I was not here during that, so but I will take your blame. That is my job took as the standard. That was the standard that was set. They thought that that was right. We obviously know that's not enough. That is why we are here today with Aviation Energy Center that is shapeless and possibly nameless <laughs> and, <laughs> and sizeless, right? I, she has the idea of perhaps letting the community name yes. it. We've I think that. that's a great idea. I've done that before and it, it's great. It's really fun. Um, because we do want to have this interaction, you know, and so it's not lip service and I'm sorry that the team that was here before I'm sure they did their best but they didn't engage properly maybe with you guys or with you or whomever it might be it is different and I really do hope you take up the team on engaging um, we know how important this is not that you need to know anything about me but I am from a very small ag community in northern Minnesota sugar beets wheat sunflowers the whole thing this stuff matters to me and that is why I work here mm -hmm. it's not for anything else. I truly believe it is a way to bring rural America into that leadership position that we all know we should be in. Mm -hmm. So, thank you all. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that I actually have worked for a solar installation company when I lived in Eugene, Oregon, so on rooftops, as has been mentioned. And um, it's rooftops, uh, uh, you know, medians, um, parking lots, like none of that is, it's it's not a substitute for large-scale solar. Large-scale solar is, has to be the primary way that we do it. Just it's way too hard to get the right siding for all the roofs because they're not facing the sun in the right way and they all need their own inverter and they all need their own process. It's just, it's way too cumbersome. It takes way too long to get the amount of solar that we actually need to get installed. So if, like if we actually want to address, you know, both this energy thing that we, you know, getting sustainable energy and for, you know, the people that have the climate concerns. Like, for me, I've been concerned about climate change my whole life, but it's, I don't see it as do or die. Like, that's not where I'm coming from. But I do think that we're, we're going to transition to solar one way or another. It's going to be the cheapest form of energy. And I don't think we're going to continue to need as much agricultural land as we currently do. And I don't think that you know, rooftops is really a viable solution. I mean, you have to maintain all these different solar panels and all these different roofs. And like in terms of having the maintenance, having the inverters, it's like, it's way better just to have it sited in one place. You go through one process to get it approved as opposed to a million different people's processes. It's just, it's, it's it, you can't compare with large scale with, like it's both and, like both are necessary, but the large scale has got to be where the majority of it comes from. So that's the one thing I have to say. I, my, I have a question just from the, the uh, trustees, because I, you know, I, I'm new to this process and this debate, so forgive me if this has been, but I didn't quite understand from Chris's um, introduction to this. Uh, is, are the trustees obligated to intervene? Just because, like I understand if it's coming, if the process of the siting is coming up from a local level, you know, it sounds like they're obligated to go by the with the, with the zoning commission. But if it's coming down from the state, it, are the trustees actually obligated to intervene, or is this a choice of the, of the it's a choice. trustees? It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. We were requested yeah. from you know, the other uh, uh, surrounding tr uh, townships and interveners uh, to join. I just want to voice my disapproval of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just one final thing. Um, 
I, I love whoever it was that made the point about Ohio being a, being a model for the state and possibly being, I, that was a terrific comment where I, I, I would so much rather live in a place that was that as opposed to the place that the Ohio Capital Journal described in an article this summer, Ohio is currently leading the nation in that we have 10 counties that have outlawed, basically outlawed solar anywhere in the county. And that's where our county government is trying to go. And I, I think it's a fair question to ask who, who, would, who would have an interest in that? And, and why? And do we want to help them with that? So there's a, I, I would give anything to have come up with this saying, but uh, I, I have to credit it to this gentleman over there who's, I believe, Eric Johnson. Did I get that right? Uh, and I'll let, you, I'll let you correct me, or you can say it yourself, but just this week, Mr. Johnson made the point that he felt it was really important to him that his grandchildren knew he did everything he could. Mm -hmm. and, and what more can you say? Mm -hmm. Your name, please. Uh, I'm Fred Stockwell. I was happy to hear Mr. Mucher's sort of initial expression of how the process goes, but I might have misunderstood. I get the impression that the town, township trustees can or cannot be an intervener and they can or cannot approve uh, regulations that are provided or offered to them from the zoning commission. So that should a meeting like this also occur at a public meeting of the zoning board, which sets rules and makes a land use plan for the county and the township. Is that where um, agreement or disagreement about whether a siting is appropriate would first occur? If it's smaller than 50 mm -hmm. megawatts, our zoning will apply. We are in the process of reviewing would not we, the Zoning Commission is in the process of creating, creating the uh, guidelines, rules, along the lines that their current thinking, Richard tried to he capture. The, the, the um, process I'm if it's going. 50 or above, it goes to the Power Siding Board, and we could be an intervener, which means we have the right to comment in detail, or we could ignore it. Okay, so if Vesper puts 49 megawatts a proposal in this township, and 49 megawatts in a proposal in such and such the next township, that suggests that that would be applicable to the local zone. So if their project happens to be 30 here and 50 there and 90 there, it would some of that would be state and some of that would be county and some of that would be local. Yeah, they could do 349 megawatt proposals in they could present three different, as three different ones in the same in, in our township if that's what they chose. We might not see it that way. But for a resident of the township, which I am, to express my interest or disinterest in something, I almost felt like listening to you that I need to go to the zoning committee's meetings, not to your meeting. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Not that we're not listening. Yes, we are listening. Thank you. Just one brief comment, please. I think that there's a difference between the political relationship between what happens, let's say, in a township and the legal relationship. You have a limited legal authority in matters of large projects or no authority. <coughs> but the signing board looks to local government actions as an indicator of whether there is support or opposition to such things as solar projects. So the point if, for example, even though, I mean, they'll, they'll say, well, all these townships intervened. That means they must be really concerned about this. And they interpret that, either honestly or otherwise, as public opposition and political opposition to the project. 
So I just want to point that out. Yes. Um, I'd like to just uh, clarify a little bit there. So yeah. just because you're intervening does not mean you are intervening in favor or opposition. You can Correct. intervene independently. But so then you file, you, f you, you do filings which indicate what your opinion is of the project. You can be independent, like I said, yeah. and still have a, a valid input or a, um, so part of, part of the only way, and this yes. is what Michelle was getting at, to yes. provide meaningful input to that hearing process yes. is to be an intervener because the judge is paying attention to what is said in the testimonies yes. and in the cross-examinations. So, and a lot of that, it happens actually in writing and not not in a live hearing. Not um, auditory. Yeah. I agree. Right. I agree with you totally. Yes. Because I'm, I'm familiar with the so, process. So too. while you can either oppose or support, you can also be independent, and it's important to be involved one way or another mm -hmm. to have meaningful input. Or you may just have one particular concern. You just somebody might intervene and say, "I'm concerned about this issue," yeah. and that's, once that's resolved. They withdraw. They say, okay, I'm, I'm good with it. So it just, just depends on the, the individual situation. Just, just for clarification, what was the substance of the intervention in the past? Opposition. When, when it's been opposition. That's the, is that, is that, that's true? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Let's, we'll, we'll put on our website uh, the statements made on behalf of Miami Township. Uh, included stuff I wrote and uh, Eric Sauer uh, volunteered his expertise around water runoff and soils and uh, we'll have those on our website. I got one more thing I'd like to say too is that they can say all what they are wanting to say here to make you believe all this stuff or whatever opinion you want to leave here with but they're not the ones that's got the ultimate say in this thing. Minds have been changed to different people over these past few years. We've got different uh, people saying things that aren't holding true. And it's just like this uh, big uh, uh, solar complex that went up in Madison County. You say that it's going to save all this farm ground. They took 3,000 acres up there, and you're saying that it's going to, you know, be so eco-friendly and all this. They take five foot off the top of the hills and fill in natural wetlands just to be as flat as they could and put their lasers on it and put panels all the way through there in order for these things to be, because that's the easiest way for them to do it. The gentleman that was farming that farm committed suicide two weeks after he got kicked off the farm because the person from in the out east let his let the farm go basically for the money. So yeah. we can we address that? Somebody else? So, sure. Yeah. I like to. Yeah. Hi Joe. Um, I'm Lindsay Workman as you know. Um, I can't all three of us are new. We're we were here when King Wood was first issued, when it was first put together. We are here now. We are trying to do it differently this time. We want to work with the community. It's not, like like Jackie said, it's not lip service. I'm from Jackson. I'm a 4-H fair girl. I, I care about the land as well. Um, we are here. If we weren't sincere about getting this project and, and working with you guys to figure out the best way for this to happen, we would not be sitting here right now. But the problem is, is that you can say all you want to, and it goes back to the people that are running the project and mm -hmm. stuff, and they, they it falls on deaf ears. It's they react to the complaints after the fact. Our CEO, yeah, so a, lot, a lot of this stuff you know, always gets uh, fixed. The problem after the problem arises. It's not fixed the problem before. That's why we put things here. in place. Okay. But and our COO has been here. One has been here. Vice president. Sorry, vice president. He has been here from the beginning. He was here in August. A few of you met him, uh, Lamar. I, some of our old landowners met him. And the landowners met him. Yes. And he was we, he was invited to some of the township meetings, but he didn't show up there. It wasn't. Well, no, he we, he was um he we met with. We can uh, bring him. Yeah, we can get him here. We'll just end it there. I don't think, there's, there's, yeah, I don't think we have to argue about what what happened or not. Yeah. If we can, I do hear you saying, for 
all your good intentions, who really has authority in <laughs> course, your organization? Yeah. I'm the project yeah. developer. I do have authority. Of course, we have to report to upper management. Right. We make you're, decisions. So if I, if I ask you to write a contract, you, your name's going to be on it? If it's under a certain value. <laughs> no, <laughs> we have well, levels of authority yeah. for where we sign contracts. And we are happy to sit down with you and put in writing and sign a contract, not just you personally, but yeah. as a county, we can agree to design considerations. We can sign a contract that's legally binding with the county, with the township most likely as well. That's why they formed an LLC. Every project company will form an LLC. I know, that's it's what I'm saying. There's a, there, these big companies have outs on everything. You, you could have this company today, and in three months, the subsidies stop on these things, and all of a sudden, it goes bankrupt, it'll sit there. Now, who owns the thing? So this decommissioning doesn't, isn't going to kick to in. in. It's going to go back to the landowners, and then they got to clean it up. There, there's just too many gray areas on these things yet. Nothing's been... Can I ask you, what would help? What, what would help change that? What, what do you need to see from us, or what do you need to re... What, what help? What would help change your mind on that? I don't know if it could. Not, not in, not in the, the, the size and scale and the, and the players that are in this thing. I just don't, I, I just don't have credibility in all these large companies. That's their, well, that's, that's why their we're money. here. Yeah, that's why we're here. Um, again, I think my, as, we, as she mentioned, Vesper is one of the few companies that has actually invested in a community affairs program. And I'm here to be that, that liaison for the community I have been. And the thing is, like, I think our, our investment is shows by us being here. We could we could easily just sit and wait for the Supreme Court to figure it out. But we're here trying to make this happen in a way that shows that we want to work with you, not just tell you what to do. And we can't make up for the past. We know that. We're trying to do differently, and that's all we can ask. We'll go Jennifer and then Tom. Tom. I was asked what, what could help us. Um, a lot of the promises that are made and a lot of the uh, specifics about how the grounds will be handled mm -hmm. and um, who will ultimately be, ultimately be responsible for that are actually in the lease agreements yes. with the landholders. And up until this point, the local nobody besides Vesper, Land Lease, whoever it was, and the landowner is privy to that information. So all those protections that we keep being promised, uh, we don't see any of that in writing anywhere. And that is one of the, yeah. That's private. something that we can change. That's a really good point. And we can provide, so this is a really competitive industry. Developers keep their leases under lock and key because of the competitive nature. Another company could come in potentially and take proprietary information from our leases. So we ask they're not publicized. I would absolutely sit down with you and walk you through a lease if you want to see exactly what goes into those contracts. The, the difficulty with that is it can be different by leaseholder. So while, you know, I might be able to, while I, you'll force me to sign an NDA and I might be able to view it, or you might make me say, yeah, you can view it, but you can't share it with anybody else, and oh, by the way, you have to support our program. So in order to do that, if I'm looking at that, you're still only going to show me the, the lease for, you know, probably my neighbor, right? But that does not protect anybody besides me. You know, so it's it's much more than just me. It's it's everybody that's involved. It's my it's our trustees. How can they know what pitfalls exist, right? If they are not privy to the agreements that have been made. And it's common for us to share lease agreements with trustees or county commissioners. Um, we obviously ask for confidentiality, so those don't get into the public record. Um, but we'd be happy to do that if that's something that would be valued by the community. Um, and additionally. I'll just say there's a lot of misinformation in this industry. I'm hearing just a lot of things. It's a really complex industry, and I understand why, you know, it might be misconstrued. So we would really appreciate an opportunity to do like a learning session yeah. where we could sit down together and kind of address your concerns point by point. Um, we can bring in subject matter experts. We can really tailor it to what you need yeah. to what you need to hear and um, need to listen. Because it is extremely complex. There's a lot going on, but there's a lot of pieces of our business and the solar industry in general that are just simply misrepresented in the comments, Mr. Feitjak, that you had, you had presented. Um, for example, our leases are not very different, landowner and landowner. We lease dozens of landowners' land. It would Have be you read the leases that are signed right now? Yes. Yes. I just want to be sure. Yep. 
Um, they are you, there are certain uh, provisions we will add to address specific landowner concerns, but we use the same form for almost every project. We get them tailored to meet state specifications, um, but they're very minimal changes because we do have to go get this project financed, right? So we're beholden to a financer. They do not want to read 12 different lease yeah. agreements. So there's just a lot of nuances there that I'd love the opportunity to walk through. Yeah. We have one more My name's Tom. Tom. And, last name. You know, I'm in favor of solar, all right? I have been for the last 25 years, all right? And I've also been in the development industry in central Ohio, you know, and I'm retired to Yellow Springs because it's a peaceful place, right? And I appreciate everything you've said, but my experience is that anytime a real estate project, and that's what really this is, the developer that can point to a project that they've already completed mm -hmm. successfully, that shows that much of what the concerns here have been addressed mm -hmm. and completed successfully mm -hmm. through all this different complex issues, which it is very complex, is very helpful in allaying a lot of these uh, fears, really, because it's all new. Absolutely. So if you, if you could um, certainly not hand out the 10,000 pages, but in a synopsis with a location, you know, with local people, with, mm -hmm. with township trustees, you know, testimonials, that kind of thing, put it together, sure. that would be very helpful. Tom, on that, we actually have a project that is very near completion down in Claremont County called Nestlewood. Marilyn got a tour of it over the summer. We're happy to bring you or anyone else that wants to come, we are happy to, to have a tour of that. Um, we can we can speak on that. I'll let Marilyn talk about it or, Harold, or Hannah talk about it a little bit more. But yes, we we have a, a project that we can point to and show you that's less than, a, it's only about an hour away. And it can kind of, I think that that is a good way to show you that we, what it looks like. Once yeah, it's with some background yeah. on paper prior to the tour. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's not a problem because, at all. Because, you know, then it can be scrutinized from all these different mm -hmm. uh, points of view and various, uh, you know, engineers, mm -hmm. urban planners, rural economists, you name absolutely. it. Absolutely, absolutely. Jennifer and Joe, we're happy to bring you guys. If you want to come tour, happy to take it. Is Nestlewood operational? No, I don't know. We have a project in Pennsylvania that um, started operations in August with um, the University of Pittsburgh. They're the primary partner on it. How mm many -hmm. megawatts is that? It's smaller, it's 20 megawatts. And Nestlewood is 80 megawatts. So, you know, 80 is maybe more comparable to what we're going in here. Um, we did a big ribbon cutting though and had a number of elected officials from the area at the um, uh, Gaucho Solar Project over outside Pittsburgh. And we'll do something similar, I would imagine, for Nestlewood. It's um, just going to become the standard. When, when do you expect Nestlewood to go on? Later this spring. Mm -hmm. um, if everything goes according to plan, it should be up and running, you know, March, April. Um, you know, construction can always be a little off schedule, but I would imagine we would do some sort of ribbon cutting in May, possibly. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe June. Do you have any other operational facilities? Those are the two right now. There are a few that Lenley's um, brought to that point and then um, they sold because they were not an IPP at the time. Um, which, you know, is what you do when you're not an IPP. It's, it's how you make money to grow your business. Um, <coughs> Is that so, I we also have yes. inter, uh, independent power producers. So it basically means you can own and operate. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, aviation is next. We have a project that um, is near completion, uh, probably maybe two years out, I think it is, um, over in northern Pennsylvania. So we you know, really do have a number of projects underway. We're going to start construction on a project out in California. That process is a little, little bit longer. We're fine, but the state process just on getting things taken care of it takes a little longer. But that's a battery um, storage project, slightly different. But um, we're really making a lot of headway um, moving forward. We have one more comment from Lamar Spreckland. I know. And then we'll wrap it up. I'm uh, a little confused. <clears throat> what is the purpose of this meeting? 
are these comments going to be sent to whom? And I, I guess, uh, what is the purpose of this meeting? We, were, we, we wanted to come and introduce the new project and open dialogue with the community about this new project and ways forward as we're at. How do you call it a new project when it's the same project? It's not the same project. Same same leaseholders? No. Nope. Same area? No. Nope. We're not utilizing the same land necessarily unless that's the feedback that we get from the community. Nope. You got um, new this leases is a already? clean slate. We so haven't started leasing. We haven't started land acquisition. We're coming here with a clean slate saying, hey, we have an interconnection agreement. How can we use this? How can we make this work? Will you be repurposing the leases that you have now for the it depends. It, we have assignment authority within our lease rights, so technically you could assign the Kingwood lease to an aviation project if that ends up being the site that is deemed suitable by the citizens. Um, if it's not, we'll start a new land campaign and go seek new land. It really depends. Excuse me, when you say aviation project, we're talking solar, right? Yes. <laughs> I think yeah. I think you're just opening yourself up for a lot of opposition. Like, uh, people are saying this is aviation, they're trying to trick us. It's really solar. Well, yeah, you could have been in the conversation. Oh yeah, we've had how about do we name it anyone revised? Do we name it you know so understood, but I feel like you kind of damn if you do damn if you don't on that one, because people would say, Oh, this is the same project even though it isn't and but I, your point is very well taken. I very well taken. We debated it for weeks. Until we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, we did. I, I find the next morning I came to you. Yeah. I think just opening yourself up to uh, charges of misinformation, <laughs> starting with the title. I mean, yeah. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for spending the evening with us and for everybody who came and brought your, um, gave up your time. And, um, did we get Tom's today? last name? What's your Tom, name? sir. <laughs> sir. <laughs> Tom, what's your last name? Logsdon. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right. I'm going to entertain it. I'm going to make a move that we adjourn for the evening. Any <laughs> host, you got a second? It's all second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>